everybody. My name is Steve. I am one of the pastors here. Welcome. Happy Mother's Day to moms uh, out there. And I uh, just want you to know, um, I, I understand we're at different, uh, many of us are different places when it comes to, uh, to Mother's Day. And, and there are folks here we had, uh, like me, we had really good moms. Uh, some of us uh, had kind of tough relationships. Uh, with our moms. And so this is sort of a bittersweet day. Uh, we have um, folks in the room who would love to be moms, and that door is not opened, at least not yet. And so this is a hard day. We know uh, that you're here. Uh, we see you. God sees you, and uh, you are loved. So let's pray together, and then we'll dive in uh, to the, the passage. God, thanks for this passage and for what it has meant is in my life and in the life of uh, our church and in the life of the church as a whole. And uh, I pray that we would come out of here understanding what it was you're saying. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So uh, what we are doing is talking about forgiveness. And let's just, uh, here's a little reminder of what we did last week. Here's a, a quick definition of forgiveness. So we're all on the same page of what forgiveness is. It is the release on the part of the offended party, the expectation that the debt will be repaid or that the offender will be punished. So uh, that's forgiveness, as we're talking about. That's the, the place that we want to get to. And we've, uh, if you have questions about forgiveness, I'm sure you do. We can't get to everything. We are trying our best, like on the podcast, to answer as many questions as possible. So make sure you uh, watch or listen to those podcasts uh, as well. This week, we're going to talk about how do we forgive. So last week was sort of a, where does forgiveness come from? This week is how do we forgive? Next week is how do we receive forgiveness from other people? And the last week is how do we receive forgiveness from God? So let's talk about this forgiveness uh, for other people. So one of the things that Jesus taught was that we have to be ready to forgive at like a moment's notice. No limits, if you're a follower of his, can be set on how much forgiveness can be offered. In fact, one of his followers, Peter, at one point said, well, what does that look like? I mean, how many times am I supposed to forgive someone for the same thing? Like seven times? And Jesus said, no, it's pretty much infinite. You don't get to set a limit. You don't get to say, well, I'm not, I just choose not to forgive you for this anymore. If you're going to follow Christ, that's the deal. And it needs to be granted without reserve. In Colossians chapter 3, the apostle Paul says that we should tie this to our own relationship with Christ. So as he has forgiven, we should forgive others. In Matthew chapter 7, uh, a famous passage, Jesus is saying, if you are going to enter into a process with someone where you talk to them about your, uh, what you've experienced from them, or if you've seen sin in their life, just make sure of something. Make sure that you have done some godly self-reflection. Because you don't want to go up and try to help a brother take the speck out of his eye and have a plank sticking out of, of your eye. It's hypocrisy. How do we forgive someone else? What, it is, what is it that we do? Matthew chapter 18, we're going to be in, uh, starting in verse 15. If your brother sins against you, go tell him his fault between you and him alone. And if he listens to you, you have won your brother. Let's just stop for just a second. So Jesus is using nomenclature of the day for many, many centuries. We have referred to humankind in male terms. So he is not saying this only applies to men. Women, you can kind of do whatever you want. But men, uh, it's only brothers. That's not what's going on here, okay? So he's just using a broad term. So if he won't listen, verse 16, take one or two others with you so that by the testimony of two or three witnesses, every fact may be established. He's quoting the Mosaic law here, the law of Moses. If he doesn't pay attention to them, tell the church. And if he doesn't pay attention even to the church, let him be like a Gentile and a tax collector to you. Truly, I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will have been bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will have been loosed in heaven. Again, truly, I tell you, if two of you on earth agree about any matter that you pray for, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there 
among them. So uh, what we have here is a process. It's a process of forgiveness. And, and it's actually a process of restoration. That's always what uh, confrontation is about between two followers of Christ. And, and that's an important point too, that Jesus is talking to followers of Jesus Christ. It's not that uh, what he is giving us here does not uh, apply or is not helpful to those who are outside the church. We should still, if we are offended by someone uh, and they are not a believer and we are, for instance, not that we shouldn't go and tell them what the fault is, like uh, we're free from that, but this, this applies and the way it applies is to, to followers of Christ within uh, the church setting, so the global church, the big C church. And the first attempt is you go to the other person without going to others so that the sin might be acknowledged and forgiveness be extended. The second uh, attempt would be to go to the other person, if, if there, that does not work, go to the other person with others, ideally those who witnessed what happened, so that the sin might be acknowledged and forgiveness extended. The third attempt is to go to the church, we'll talk about what that means in a moment, so that sin might be acknowledged and forgiveness extended. And the fourth step is to turn them away from Christian fellowship. Guess why? So the sin might be acknowledged and forgiveness extended. That has to be the purpose. That the sin would be acknowledged in this person's life and that forgiveness would be extended to them. Let's unpack each step of this restoration. Here's the first step. You go to the person privately. Why? Think about this for just a moment. Why would you go privately to that person? We have ways of getting around this, by the way, in uh, our modern world. So one of the ways we get around this is like, well, I just really need somebody else's perspective. And so this, something has happened between me and someone else, but I, I need the wisdom and perspective of someone else. So I'm gonna go talk to my best friend who won't tell anybody, and, and I'm gonna talk to them about, I just need your godly perspective. No, you don't. No, you don't. You don't need their perspective. We, we, we already have a coach who's told us exactly what we need to do. Another way we do it is say, oh, I just really need prayer about this. Yes, we all need prayer. I understand that. But sometimes I need prayer for this as a way of just gossiping about the situation and forming a posse of our own. We don't need someone else to weigh in on prayer. We know exactly what we need to do. We need to go do that thing. We need to do that between us and the other person. Why? See, uh, we think, this is uh, the American answer, we think that this is about protecting ourselves. Jesus loves us and he cares about us, which is true. And so what he really wants is for us, brother or sister, to go to another brother or sister and have a very hard conversation so that our reputation is not ruined, it is protected. It's like, I, I, I should be protected as the one who's offended someone, I, I should be protected from this. That is not true. Jesus is not concerned about our reputation. He's concerned about his reputation. This is not about our name being dragged through the mud. It's about his name being dragged through the mud. Do you understand that if, if our sin that we have committed, we do something against someone else or we do something to offend, the reason we, we want to keep this as small as possible is because who's, who's around us? Well, there are people who are young in their faith. There are some who are not yet followers of Christ. There are some who might be struggling in their faith. And if they see sin being committed like just easily, it's not that big a deal, what it can do in their minds and in their hearts is start to turn to, to go, well, I, who cares? <laughs> I mean, this person who's more mature than I am, they're sinning, it's not that big a deal. And we kind of turn down the volume of sin. It becomes acceptable to us, and it's fine. This is not about us. When Matthew 18 is, is like not followed and we're confronted about it, we get offended for us. Who are we? 
I can't remember a single time when someone has confronted me about something where I've gotten offended for the name of Jesus, that my sin has been that egregious that it might wound the cause of Christ. It's always been about my own ego. That's step one. Protect the name of Jesus. Let's keep this as small as possible. The second step is the witnesses. These are not witnesses that are recruited from a group of our friends who would probably agree with us on something. Ideally, these are witnesses who have seen this themselves. They've seen this behavior. They've seen this happen. And so now you're sitting across from this group of, of people who are saying, well, it's not just them, it's, it's us too. Imagine what is going on spiritually when you say, no, I refuse to listen to you. You're here and you're presenting this to me and I will not listen to that, okay? Now there's a group of people sitting in front of you saying, uh, this, no, this is true. No, 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 no. I refuse to listen to that. What's going on? There's a hardening of heart that's happening. The third step, Jesus says, is to tell it to the church. The church looks very different in Jesus' day than it does in our day. This would be more akin to our grow groups is what it would look like in, in the ancient church. It's interesting, Jesus says, tell it to the church, and the church doesn't even exist when Jesus says this. He tell it to the ecclesia, the fellowship, the gathering. It's not just this room. We, we have some leeway about how this is interpreted. Ideally speaking, this would happen in grow groups where something would happen and, and you would sit with the whole grow group and you say, okay, this is like level three. We've escalated this now. Now the whole group has to talk about this. And then from there, it can go uh, up the ladder of leadership if it needs to. Uh, some, someone told me years ago that if someone calls you a horse's patoot, you should ignore them. If two people tell you a horse's patoot, you should probably pay attention, but if three people tell you your horse is patoot, buy a saddle. <laughs> and that's what's going on. There's evidence being built. No, no, this is true. We're not kidding around here. The fourth step here is to treat them uh, like a Gentile or a tax collector. It's a, way, a Jesus way of saying an unbeliever. So what does this mean? Does that mean you, you kick them out of the church? Well, Gentiles and tax collectors were not allowed in the temple in Jesus' day. They were, they were not allowed to enter the, the temple area. But uh, what did Jesus, we've got to remember who's saying this, Jesus teaching this. What did Jesus do with Gentiles and tax collectors? He fellowshiped with them. He ate with them. He hung out with them. He ministered to them. He loved them. He told them about the gospel. So here's the distinction here in our world. This is not about, uh, you know, you've committed sin and now you're outside, we set you outside the church. That would be a pretty severe thing. It can happen, but it's a rather severe deal. So uh, I say often that we know who is in the room. I, I know who's in the room. I, there are people here uh, who are like literally in the room or watching online or whatever who have been a part of Bethany for a long time. Maybe you've been followers of Jesus for a long time. And this is your church and you're growing in Christ and you're trying to mature in your faith and all those things. But then there's a lot of us who are part of things here who we don't know where we are spiritually. We're not sure what we believe about Jesus. We're still trying to figure this out. Like, do I believe the Bible? Do I believe Jesus is really who? He said he was, like all these things. We're working that out, and we're here. We're glad you're here. This is where you should be to ask those questions. It's wonderful. We know you're here. We pray for you. And you can be a part of so many of the things that we do here, but the truth is you can't be a part of everything that we do here. There's actually like an inner circle of followers of Jesus. One, one example of this is communion. We say this every month when we take communion together. I stand up here, you've heard me say this, and I say, this is open to anybody who's a follower of Christ, but if you're not yet a follower of Christ, would you just let the elements pass you by? This is not for you. This is something that we take part in as believers. Baptism is another example. It's not for unbelievers to do. It's only for believers to do. There are leadership positions here at church that would only be for those who have put their faith and trust in Jesus, 
who would say, yes, I am a Christ follower, and, and here's the evidence of that. So we have folks in our midst who are not yet Christ followers. We love them. We love you. We pray for you. And the truth is, we do treat you a bit differently. There's a different level of Christian fellowship available in our prayers that you come to, to Jesus Christ. Let's keep this in mind about this process. We have to be very careful of being too black and white, too binary about this, about this process. Let's be very careful. These are steps that must be followed. Well, this is not meant to be a step-by-step -step instruction manual. Let me give you an example of this. So uh, before I came to Bethany, like between churches, um, I was a handyman. I like rented myself out as a handyman. And one of the things that I would do was I would change tub spouts for people. Okay, a little spout that comes out of the wall. So here, I'm going to teach you how to change a tub spout. You ready? Everybody, now everybody can do this. Uh, so step one is to remove the old tub spout. That's the first thing. Step two is just clean the surrounding area. Step three is to install the new one. And step four is to test it to make sure it's not leaking. Everybody got it? All right. You feel really confident installing a tub spout? Uh, uh, if this was the only information you had, no. Because what happens um, when you look at your tub spout and you realize, I don't know how to get it off. <laughs> there are at least two kinds of spouts. There are the ones that are on, that are slip-ons, and they have this little set screw that's usually hidden underneath, and you gotta get an Allen key and get under there, and I'm telling you, times out of 10, it is like rusted on and you can't get it out again? Like, what do you do then? That's not part of the instructions. Some of them are not like that. They just unscrew right off the end. That's great, except nothing on here about how you have to cut the, the sealant, the caulk that's sticking it to the wall. If you don't do that, you're, gonna, you're not gonna get that thing off. What happens when you find water damage behind the wall? Or you find that somebody else tried to fix something before and they messed everything up and now you've gotta undo it and redo it again? That's not part of it. In other words, you have to have a little understanding, a little experience with how things work here in order to make this easy four-step process work for you. It is technically correct information, absolutely. But it just doesn't tell you everything you need to know. This is the same with the process of forgiveness and restoration that Jesus is giving us here. Do not oversimplify it. You have to be able to adjust as you go with the Spirit of God leading that process. So here's the temptation. The temptation for us is to turn this into a formula where any variation of the process nullifies the rest of the process. So uh, we get confronted and we look at this and we go, oh, wait a second. Wait a second. There has been a technical foul of Matthew 18. And so then someone is trying to talk to us about sin or whatever. No, 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 Matthew 18, Matthew 18. I don't have to listen. Well, Matthew 18, Matthew 18. You didn't Matthew 18. I don't have to listen to you, Matthew 18, Matthew 18. This happens all the time. What's going on? I don't want to deal with my sin. That's why I do this. I don't want to deal with the fact that you've confronted me on something that is true in my life. And my pride says, this is how you fight back. You attack the process. And so that's what we do. So uh, overall, when confronting someone, it is a good idea for the process to be the thing that drives the vehicle and for the person's offense to be riding in the back seat. In other words, to not make the offense such a big deal that, well, we're just throwing the process out the window because what you did is so big. Wrong. When we're being confronted, we flip that around. When we're the ones being confronted, we need to see the sin of what we have done as being the thing that's driving the vehicle. 
the important thing. And the process, whatever it is, is in the back seat. Look, we'll deal with that later. What's the important thing? The important thing is that we get this taken care of. This is part of not loving ourselves so much, loving Jesus more, saying I'm more concerned that he not be offended. I'm more concerned that his church not be damaged. I'm more concerned that our, uh, the people in my life who hear about this have an opportunity uh, to grow in their faith and not see this as an excuse to, to sin on their own. There are specific situations where Matthew 18 does not apply, at, like at all. There are certain times when uh, rules in the Bible countermand Matthew 18. Leaders who sin are called out directly and usually publicly. Do we think that the Apostle Paul didn't know the teaching of Jesus? And yet somehow, for some reason, when Peter was exhibiting racist attitudes, Paul opposed him publicly and said, hey, you're a racist. God saved you from that. Knock it off. Publicly, because he's a leader. If something happens publicly, it needs to be rebuked publicly. Do you think that if we had a membership meeting here and someone stood up in the middle of the membership meeting and started blaspheming the name of Jesus, that I would say, no, well, let's, everybody, let's just let that person finish. And then afterwards, I'll kind of take them aside in my office and say, bro, I, I need to talk to you about something. And you know what you said? Is, no, absolutely not. I'm going to cut you off. And I'm going to say, stop. And I'm going to rebuke that right there in public because that's something that you did publicly. Well, where's Matthew 18 in that? Well, this trumps that. Someone who's in an abusive relationship. If you're in an abusive relationship, you don't need to sit down with your abuser and each time that you receive this abuse and say, look, okay, uh, let's just walk through this, okay? Um, you've offended me, and here's how you've offended me. And then hope that you get abused in a place where other people can witness it so you can step to the person properly. And No, of course not. If you're in an abusive relationship, get safe. Get out, get safe. We'll, we'll figure out the process later. But your safety is a primary concern. How Jesus finishes this thought in verses 18 through 20 is with some very often quoted uh, directives. Here's, here's what he says. Truly I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will have been bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will have been loosed in heaven. Again, truly, I tell you, if two of you on earth agree about the matter that you pray for, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For if two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there among them. This is tacked on to the end of the part about forgiving, forgiving each other. Here's what Jesus is saying. There is a correlation between what the church decides should happen to someone who is in sin and what is done in heaven. Part of the application for these verses has to do with consensus in prayer. Uh, several years ago, I prayed something. I was, uh, Kathy and I were praying together and I prayed something and when the prayer was done, she said, I don't agree with that. I don't agree with that prayer. I'm not like adding my name to that. I'm not signing on the bottom of that one. And the prayer kind of came out of my brokenness. It didn't come out of my walk with Christ. She was right. It was not a great prayer. We didn't agree. We didn't have consensus. There are things that we need to have consensus about. And when we have consensus about that, there are things that happen spiritually. Another part of this has to do with the unity of the church when it comes to rendering a decision about someone who is in sin. We make a decision. That decision is made. God goes, sounds strange, God and heaven goes along with this, with this decision in some way, shape, or form. Now, God can overrule our decision, certainly. But we, there's spiritual power and authority that the church brings to bear in the world. There's such a thing as spiritual abuse. 
Spiritual abuse is overwhelming power over someone else in a spiritual situation that is not godly. And so there has to be agreement between godly people uh, in leadership about what are we gonna do about this sin. But the overarching principle here is the presence of Jesus offers real empowerment when the church is gathered together in Jesus' name. We've had this experience, I hope you've had this experience, that you've been in fellowship, you've been in worship, and a, a line of a song has done something in you, or you just found yourself very emotional for a reason you can't really explain, or someone's name or face has popped into your mind as, as you've been hearing the word of God proclaimed, or something has happened where you have this conviction. Something's happening in the room. What's happening in the room? Jesus is here. It's not that when you're walking, you walk, like I walk into my office and I'm there by myself and then, you know, Pastor David walks in. And it's like, oh good, David's here. Now Jesus is here because two or three are gathered. So now it was like he was by himself, no Jesus. I'm by myself, no Jesus. But we get together and then there's Jesus. That's not what the passage means. The passage is that when we get together in the unity and fellowship, that God's spirit is there with us. When we have been offended, when we have witnessed sin, we need to consider a few things. First is this, um, life together in community means that we're going to offend each other. Um, I, I'll just be honest with you, I almost start like my first Sunday here at Bethany, I wanted to apologize to everybody and just say, hey, look, I am really sorry, okay? I'm, I just want to apologize in advance because some, at some point in time, I'm probably gonna say something or do something uh, with, for no intent, no reason, but I'm gonna like step on your toes in some way. I'm gonna say something dumb, whatever, and I just want to apologize in advance, <laughs> but you can't do that. You can't like pre-apologize for stuff. <laughs> If we are going to do fellowship together, if we're going to do life together, we're going we're gonna to do that. It, it is, to quote my dear friend Tammy, who you met a few minutes ago, this is a dance. What we do in fellowship is a dance. I'm sorry to the Baptists in the room, but it is a dance. So I, I apologize if I've offended you. Uh, and we step on each other's toes sometimes. We bump into each other sometimes. We, it happens. And when we do that, we go, Sorry. I'm sorry I did that. I didn't mean to do that, but I just did because we're here and it's a crowded dance floor and we just bumped into each other. And that should be the end of it. However, that doesn't negate the fact that we did bump into somebody. If we have been wronged, the, the pain is real, okay? You're not being like overly emotional or anything like that for having experienced the offense. It happens. Likewise, we have a choice about how we respond. What do, how do we respond? We don't have to create excessive drama. Okay, some of us are a little wired to be more dramatic, right? And we need people around us who are like, hey, that is great, Meryl Streep. Turn it down a few <laughs> notches. Right? We, uh, anything that happens is like big. Well, here's Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 20, verse 3. Honor belongs to the person who ends a dispute. Any fool can get himself into a quarrel. It's true. Do we really have to ramp it up? We can even choose not to be offended. We have that option. I realized that the things that used to bother me in my 20s and 30s and some of the stuff that was thrown at me, you know, early on in ministry, I, I, don't, it doesn't, I don't even clock it anymore. I don't even, like, pay attention to it anymore. I, it doesn't hit my radar. So that's the work of God in my life to give me something that I'm still working on, and that is the word resilience. We need to be people of resilience. As we grow in Christ, we need to become more resilient and so as we become more and more like Christ, we're not bothered by things. Proverbs chapter 12, verse 16, a fool's displeasure is known at once, but whoever ignores an insult is sensible. You know, we can just ignore it. We have the ability. Proverbs 19, 11, 
A person's insight gives him patience, and his virtue is to overlook an offense. Again, we just have the choice. Now, I say that, there is balance here. Because overlooking an offense for some of us is sometimes used as an excuse. Some of us will just keep getting punched and mistreated and whatever again and again and again and again and again, and we're like, I'm just overlooking the offense. No, we're not. We are, we are recording every offense. We are allowing that internally, what has happened, to define the relationship. We just are not confrontational. We don't want to confront it. And we think it's easier to keep getting punched in the face than it is to say, hey, stop punching me in the face. Because that's confrontational. But courage is actually often refusing to go back into that relationship. Refusing to allow someone to treat us that way. Look, if, if you see someone being mistreated, someone that you love, and, and someone is mistreating them, don't you want to step into the middle of that? Don't you want to say, hey, wait a second, you can't treat my friend like this? Of course you do. So, uh, question, why wouldn't you do that for you? Why wouldn't you step in the middle of somebody mistreating you and say, wait a second, you can't treat me like that? Why wouldn't you advocate for yourself? For those of us who are either receiving um, some sort of correction or who are going to have to give correction to anybody, just understand that step one should really be as far as we ever need to go. God forbid that we ever have a group of people in front of us having to say, no, this is true. What's being said is true. You're not hearing it, but it's true. This is what we've seen. This is what, how hard does our heart have to be? Requiring a step two, ooh, and three. Oh my goodness. It should be very easy for us when we find we've done something wrong to say, I'm so sorry. You know what, you're right. Should not have done that. I apologize. Forgive me. Uh, my, uh, I had two best friends in high school. And um, we were friends through high school. Uh, we were friends in college. We went to different colleges and then ended up transferring into the same college. We lived together in college. Um, I was in um, one of the guy's weddings. The other guy's... Uh, were in my wedding, but one of the guys named Carter, I was not in his, his wedding. Because something happened after we uh, graduated college and we'd been through everything you can imagine together, and yet something uh, happened after, after we left college that like, drove a wedge between us. And if you ask me what that is, I will tell you that I don't know. I don't know. Over the years, I tried to reach out to Carter and say, hey, look, whatever happened, whatever I did, I'm ready to own my part of it. Will you just tell me what I did? And I'm happy to do that. I never heard back from him. A couple of years ago, my phone rang, and I picked it up. It was another friend from high school. He said, did you hear about Carter? I said, no, what's going on? And this was sometime in the fall. He said, well, in the spring, Carter got a very rare form of lung cancer. He went very quickly and he died. His memorial service is tomorrow in Texas. I'm in Chicago. I found out later on that he'd spent kind of the last week of his life in the hospital just recounting good times with friends and he made amends with some people, but not with me. I found this to be true, Proverbs chapter 18, verse 19. An offended brother is harder to reach than a fortified city, and quarrels are like the bars of a fortress. But it doesn't have to be that way. It just takes courage. And it takes a willingness to yield ourselves to God. Let's pray together.
Lord, you know um, that this is hard for us. Forgiveness is hard uh, for us on every level. Uh, it's hard. It's hard to be the ones to receive correction. It's hard to be the ones to try to give correction. Uh, it's just tough. And I pray for your wisdom in this process. Lord, I ask that uh, you would guide us as we, we do this. Um, God, we have people in our lives who uh, may need to say some things to us that are hard things. May we receive it well and respond well. We have some people in our lives, we may need to say something too. And may we do that process in a way that honors you. Uh, God, I you know, uh, b before my brothers and sisters, how often I've talked to you about Carter in the last couple of years. And um, I'm so grateful that he was a believer and that he is with you. And um, I pray for continued healing in, in my heart and for any other that um, were not able to receive forgiveness from someone they loved while they were alive who were not able to extend forgiveness to someone. Um, but thank you for healing our hearts. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Hey, if you would like prayer for anything at all, there would be a couple of us in the prayer corner. We'd love to pray for you.